if it wasn't for you people who were down there and did that, believe me, I know in my heart that I wouldn't be here today. Richard Pryor was a comedic genius and stand-up legend. He redefined comedy for generations as the first black person to host Saturday Night Live and earn $1 million in Hollywood. However, after an illustrious career, seven wives, and a constant battle with cocaine, the beloved comedian suffered a tragic death, the details of which have finally been released to the public. Today, we'll look at Richard Pryor's prolific career as a comedian and pioneer for black entertainers before unveiling the tragic details of his death. There's a hell I've been there. There's a hell. And the devil turned out to be me. Richard Pryor, a tragic beginning. Richard Franklin Lennox Thomas Pryor was born on December 1, 1940, in Peoria, Illinois. Pryor's childhood was tumultuous growing up in the brothel run by his grandmother, Marie Center. Pryor's mother, Gertrude L., worked at the brothel as a prostitute. His father was Leroy Buck Carter Pryor, who was a former boxer, hustler, and pimp. Gertrude abandoned Pryor when he was 10, leaving the child under Marie's care, though the woman was violent and frequently assaulted Pryor for displaying any of his eccentricities. Pryor grew up in Marie's brothel alongside three other children. He was tragically sexually abused in the brothel at the age of seven. The Pryor family opened the brothel, the famous door, in the 1940s in the neighborhood of North Washington Street. During Pryor's childhood, the neighborhood was relaxed yet lively. Pryor witnessed many societal firsts, mixing of races, drunk brawling and conviviality that left indelible marks on his young mind and aspirations for the stage. Pryor's kindergarten teacher notified his parents that he was seemingly emotionally unstable. Faced with many complex problems and hurdles, the child was forced to look out for himself, knowing that even his parents had already failed to do so. In the early 1950s, the construction of a bridge connecting Peoria to East Peoria ushered the remaining members of the Pryor clan out toward the 2400 block of South Adams Street, an area of town with few black residents. After the demolition of North Washington Street, Pryor was subsequently enrolled in the nearly all-white elementary school of Blaine Sumner. He struggled to find his place there, but he would ultimately come into his own. Since his earliest memories, Pryor had been an admirer of the silver screen. He was particularly interested in the likes of Red Skelton, John Wayne, and Lash LaRue, a pseudo-Western star whose campy eccentricity sparked something in Pryor. In 1952, Pryor was introduced to Jerry Lewis's on-screen persona through Sailor Beware, which blended elements of clumsy boyishness with kinetic energy. Lewis's performance inspired Pryor to create pantomimes to help him integrate with his schoolmates. While in the sixth grade, an adult finally showed up for Pryor. His sixth grade teacher, Margaret Yingst, proposed that if he could thenceforth arrive at school on time, she would provide the budding class clown with a free segment of 10 minutes per Friday at the end of class, during which he could perform for his classmates. After she struck a deal with Pryor, he was rarely late again, coming to terms with his love of performing. Two years later, in 1955, Pryor entered the George Washington Carver Community Center in pursuit of Carver's Youth Talent Guild. Instead, he found Miss Juliet Whitaker, whom Pryor has credited with much of his success and journey out of poverty. Juliet Whitaker was one of the few adults who took the time to understand Pryor seeing through his cold, closed-off demeanor that likely stemmed from childhood abuse. Whitaker took things a step farther than Yinkst, taking him under her wing and teaching the boy about the mechanics of theater and the larger world. Detecting great promise in Pryor, Whitaker educated him on writing, set designing, acting and directing. Whitaker was also a black woman, and the two spent long afternoons in her office, providing Pryor with a positive role model and cheerleader that he had never had before. Alongside Whitaker, Pryor absorbed her bohemian interpretation of art, its meaning, and her sense of racial pride. His time at the Carver Center instilled in Pryor a passion for creativity and artistic pursuits. It was, unfortunately, short-lived, 
as the ninth grader was ultimately expelled in 1956 due to an altercation with his science teacher, Walter Fink. As a result of his expulsion and the era of history he lived in, Pryor was forced to fall into a life of physical labor. As a young black man in the 50s, he had been statistically marked out for this lifestyle. Consequently, he had no available free time to engage with Miss Whitaker. He spent the next several years working as a janitor in a strip club, a boot black, a delivery man, and a factory hand folding cowhides. His new routine of mundane, desultory tasks offered Pryor little in the realm of creative satisfaction or accomplishment. During this segment of his life, Pryor looked forward to his limited free time, which he would spend in the company of his friends. However, he was once again left without parental guidance. At the age of 16, his daughter Renee was born, who had been conceived with an ex-girlfriend. Unfortunately, she would not become a major factor in Pryor's life. One of Pryor's friends, Matt Clark, recalled that Pryor and his friend typically hung around State Park, and with no formal stage to utilize in performance, Pryor performed on the streets of Peoria for passersby. Unbeknownst to Pryor, his comedic stylings on the street would foreshadow the wino character that would later make him famous and change his life forever. Pryor gets out of Peoria. Pryor's desire to both find an adventure and get out of Peoria led him to enlist in the U.S. Army in April 1959. However, this would prove to be an unwise choice, as Pryor would spend nearly his entire two-year stint in Army jail. He faced racial discrimination and was subjected to various challenges during his service. These experiences would later influence his comedy and social commentary, as Pryor often incorporated themes of race, identity, and injustice into his stand-up routines. Pryor was infamously eliminated from the service for engaging in an attack against a specialist fourth class. Allegedly, while stationed in West Germany, Pryor and a few other black soldiers were angered at a white soldier's overly amused reaction to a racially charged scene in Douglas Stirk's film, Imitation of Life. Together, Pryor and the black soldiers beat and stabbed the specialist, although his injuries were non-fatal. Pryor returned to Peoria with 25 days of pay, determined to pursue an entertainment career. He would spend a few final years in Peoria, during which time he would solidify his comedic origins. In 1960, Pryor went to Harold Parker, an old friend and neighbor from North Washington Street, to appeal for a job. He had just married his first wife, Patricia Price, and they were so strapped for cash that they were forced to move in with Marie. Pryor and Price would welcome Richard Pryor, Jr. in July 1962. After some back and forth, Parker offered Pryor a position at a nightclub he ran, where the budding performer would act as a bartender and MC. Harold's Club was located on a block of North Washington Street that had survived the construction of the Murray Baker Bridge. It was also the birthplace of many of Pryor's original characters, a wacky car salesman that delighted in the sales of lemons or a dramatic street-savvy wino. Harold's Club drew clientele from a range of backgrounds. Attendees were a blend of black and white, gay and straight, young and old, serving the local community as a convivial tavern, which encouraged members of the community to integrate. It subsequently raised a few eyebrows. This resulted in a 1961 motion by Peoria's mayor for the closure of Harold's Club. Looking for more comedic work, Pryor next approached Briss Collins, a fellow resident from North Washington Street and operator of Collins Corner, an uppity club specializing in R&B and modern jazz, appealing to a majority black clientele. Pryor continued to hone his craft at Collins Corner, but the club's financial burdens would soon bring forth the same fate of Harold's Club, and the venue shut its doors for a while. Someone close to Pryor reportedly suggested that he pursue collaboration with a review they suggested that Pryor feature female impersonators at an East St. Louis review, inspiring and reinvigorating Pryor. Despite the fact that leaving meant he had to abandon Price and his infant son, he felt called to perform and left Peoria for good. Pryor moves up. In 1963, Richard Pryor fled Peoria and moved to New York City. 
There, he regularly performed alongside performers such as Woody Allen and Bob Dylan at local bars and clubs. Pryor opened for the legendary singer and pianist Nina Simone at the Village Gate on one of his first gigs. However, according to Simone, Pryor was struck with an intense bout of performance anxiety. He shook like he had malaria. He was so nervous. I couldn't bear to watch him shiver, so I put my arms around him there in the dark and rocked him like a baby until he calmed down. The next night was the same, and the next, and I rocked him each time. Bill Cosby was a massive inspiration for Pryor, who admired Cosby's use of middlebrow comedy to appeal to the masses. His early material was decidedly less raunchy than what was to come for the comedian and effectively introduced him to many casual comedy fans. Soon enough, Pryor appeared on variety shows such as The Ed Sullivan Show, The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, and The Merv Griffin Show. On May 9, 1965, Pryor first appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. Introduced by Sullivan as the youthful Richard Pryor, his routine started a little shaky as the new comedian struggled with nerves. However, the problem disappeared almost as fast as it arrived, and Pryor soon had the audience in the palm of his hand. His routine commenced with Pryor talking about being a naive Midwesterner, trying to navigate the fast-paced world of New York City. The audience was immediately engaged as they could relate to his experience. Overall, his debut performance on Sullivan's show was polite and clean. His comedy would later devolve into something different, blunt and controversial. Pryor was officially on the public's radar and his success brought him to Las Vegas where he worked as a professional comic. At this time, Pryor's material was still generally PG and some of his sets from 1966 and 1967 reflect this which were later featured on the compilation CD Evolution, Revolution, The Early Years, 1966 to 1974, 2005. However, 1967 would mark a pivotal moment in Pryor's career, completely altering the trajectory of his comedic reach. Described in his autobiography Pryor Convictions, 1996, as an epiphany, Pryor famously made history at a Las Vegas show in September of 1967. He walked onto the Aladdin Hotel stage, looked out at the sold-out crowd, Dean Martin was also in attendance, and spoke into the microphone, what the fuck am I doing here, before walking off. The autobiography would also allude to his underrepresented bisexuality. In the book, Pryor expanded on his two-week relationship with Matrasha, a trans woman. He likened the experience to two weeks of being gay foreshadowing the conspiratorial sexual theories that would arise after the comedian's death. Prior convictions also revealed that Pryor had been heavily abusing cocaine during this period, spawning a tumultuous era the comedian described as a walking nervous breakdown. He struggled to connect with his original material, no longer believing in it. Additionally, he struggled to grapple with a strictly segregated society that only valued him as a source of entertainment. These feelings of insecurity were only exasperated by the deaths of his mother and father in 1967 and 1968. All of these factors contributed to Pryor's epiphany and the commencement of his new style of comedy. Pryor's New Style Pryor's refusal to perform the routine deemed safe by higher-ups infuriated local talent bookers and club owners. Pryor began incorporating explicit language and themes in his routines, frequently using the N-word, discomforting the white majority. He produced his first comedic recording in 1968. The debut Richard Pryor on the Dove Enterprise label showcased Pryor's style of comedy during this period. As a result of his transitional and provocative phase, his career opportunities slightly dwindled. In 1969, Pryor moved to Berkeley, California. There, he immersed himself in the popular teachings of the counterculture that prevailed during the late 60s and the infamous Summer of Love. Counterculture is a cultural movement or subculture that opposes or seeks to challenge mainstream society's dominant social norms, values, and practices. During the 60s, activists and supporters like Pryor challenged the government, promoting civil rights, the anti-war movement, feminism, environmentalism, and the hippie movement. Pryor was increasingly exposed to social justice and civil rights matters, befriending black activists such as Ishmael Reed, Huey Newton, and Eldridge Cleaver. Although his initial time in California served as some personal exile from the entertainment industry, 
It wasn't long before Pryor was back working in clubs, sharing his newly adopted style of incendiary comedy. He frequently used the N-word, shocking audiences and appealing to the black population. Despite his scandalous performances, Pryor's new brand was strangely authentic. He utilized physicality, natural stage presence, and willingness to discuss taboos in his sets, tackling racism and sexuality while igniting the venue in a fiery rage of laughter. He increasingly drew on his dire upbringing, basing characters and routines on elements of his childhood, such as the black entertainers, criminals, artists, and neighbors he encountered while living in North Washington Street. For the first time, a black comedian had the spotlight and bravely shed light on the experiences of marginalized individuals from an increasingly mainstream platform. He has since stated, for the first time in my life, I had a sense of Richard Pryor as the person. I understood myself, I knew what I stood for, knew what I had to do, I had to go back and tell the truth. By the 1970s, Pryor's talent had brought him to the writer's room at various television shows and broadcasts. He wrote for shows such as Sanford and Son, The Flip Wilson Show, and a 1973 Lily Tomlin special, which earned him his first Emmy Award. During this time, Pryor attempted to break into mainstream television, though his efforts were largely unrewarded. Pryor would appear in several films throughout the 1970s, such as Lady Sings the Blues, 1972, The Mac, 1973, Uptown Saturday Night, 1974, Silver Streak, 1976, Car Wash, 1976, Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, 1976, Which Way Is Up, 1977, Greased Lightning, 1977, Blue Collar, 1978, and The Muppet Movie, 1979. In 1970, Pryor signed with Laugh Records, a comedy-focused independent record label, before releasing Craps After Hours in 1971. The album quickly became a cult success amongst black audiences, though it laid the groundwork for what would come. The project centered on black and white relations, sex in the city, and cops and politics, all while bringing humor to the contentious topics. Still relatively unknown, Pryor appeared in the documentary Watt Stacks, 1972, in which he satirized the absurdities of race relations in Watts in the United States. Shortly after, in 1973, Pryor signed a more significant deal with a more prominent label, Stax Records. 1974 brought the release of Pryor's third breakout album, That NR's Crazy. His previous label, Laugh, claimed ownership of Pryor's recording rights, and they nearly succeeded in their attempt for an injunction, which would have effectively prevented copies of the album from being sold. However, Pryor was becoming increasingly popular and his access to lawyers finally released him from Laugh. That NR's Crazy was a massive commercial and critical success. The album featured Pryor's trademark blend of incisive social commentary, sharp observational humor, and raw, unflinching honesty. It significantly departed from Pryor's earlier, more mainstream comedy style as he delved into more provocative and politically charged material. The album covered various topics, including race relations, poverty, drug addiction, and the absurdities of everyday life. That NR's Crazy was eventually certified gold by the RIAA and won the 1975 Grammy Award for Best Comedy Album despite its initial controversy. In 1976, Pryor released his next comedic hit, Bicentennial N Asterisk R. The album took its title from the celebration of the Bicentennial of the United States which occurred in 1976. Pryor used this theme as a backdrop to explore race, identity, and the state of America during that period. Pryor's comedy was always sharp, irreverent, and unapologetically honest. The release of his fourth album continued Pryor's success streak, becoming his third consecutive gold album. Additionally, the album earned him his third consecutive Grammy Award for Best Comedy Recording. Now recording with Warner Brothers Records, Pryor faced legal difficulties with his disgruntled former label, Laugh. With every successful record Pryor released with Warner Brothers, Laugh, in an attempt to capitalize off of the rising comedian's fame, would subsequently publish an album of Pryor's older, formerly unreleased material, as per the agreement Pryor reached with Laugh following the success of That Inner's Crazy. 
Laff would carry out these practices until 1983, even going so far as to select cover art for each album which corresponded to several films Pryor was involved in, such as Are You Serious? 1976, The Wizard of Comedy for his role in The Wiz, 1978, and Insane for Stir Crazy, 1980. Pryor, who had co-written Blazing Saddles 1974, was slotted to play the film's lead role but perhaps due to the off-putting legal situation at Laugh, could not ensure Pryor and instead went with Cleavon Little. Richard Pryor, one of the highest paid black entertainers in Hollywood. It was 1975 and Pryor's career had reached unprecedented heights. That year he became the first black person ever to host Saturday Night Live during the show's first season. Pryor's episode of SNL has become a piece of historical data in the more significant comedic industry. Pryor's longtime girlfriend, Catherine McKee, briefly appeared alongside her partner before the infamous Word Association skit aired. NBC, familiar with Pryor's incendiary style, insisted on instituting a tape delay in fear of the comedian pushing the envelope too far. Nevertheless, Pryor took to the stage, accompanied by Chevy Chase and the original cast of SNL, and provided viewers with a television experience unparalleled by Pryor's contemporaries. In 1977, Pryor tried his hand at hosting his own variety show. The Richard Pryor Show premiered that year but was canceled after only four episodes. It is likely due to white Americans' discomfort that Pryor's show was canceled. Refusing to alter the content of his material to appease a demographic supportive of segregation, Pryor said, They offered me ten episodes, but I said all I wanted to in four. During the short-lived run of The Richard Pryor Show, he portrayed the first black president of the United States, alluded to racism by appearing nude on a satirized version of the Titanic, discussed gun violence earnestly, and poked fun at the Star Wars cantina. In 1978, tragedy struck the Pryor family. Richard Pryor had recently begun sharing the spotlight with his grandmother, Marie, showcasing her expertise in cooking soul food with the world. Pryor organized several feature stories in local newspapers to help showcase Marie's talent. Funnily enough, Marie, the former madam of a brothel, had to pose as a domestic housewife who'd spent the greater portion of her life doting on and serving a husband. In December of 1978, Marie tragically passed away at the age of 79. Pryor was reportedly devastated by his grandmother's death. He promptly returned to Peoria to attend the funeral, where witnesses observed the comedian shaking like a rag doll. He was just crying and talking, mama, mama, mama. Possibly inspired by the sobering reality of Marie's death, Pryor traveled to Kenya in 1979. The trip was recommended to him by a psychiatrist after his battle with substance abuse reached a new low. Jennifer Lee Pryor, one of seven total wives Pryor would marry in his life, had reportedly found the comedian surrounded by prostitutes and drugs. Pryor, whose radical success was partly due to his liberal use of the N-word, visited Kenya's National Museum. Afterward, while sitting in the hotel lobby, his conscience asked him to look around and identify the N asterisk S. When Pryor couldn't see any, the voice responded, because there aren't any. From that point forward, Pryor swore that he would never use the N-word again, even admitting regret over ever having uttered the word on a stage or off it. It was a wretched word. Its connotations weren't funny, even when people laughed. Upon his return to the United States, Pryor made history yet again. He became the first black actor in history to earn $1 million for a film. Hired to star in Stir Crazy, Pryor was about to take his career to even taller peaks. However, the comedian's substance abuse had taken a turn for the worse. On June 9, 1980, reports heavily indicated that Pryor, on a cocaine-free basing binge, doused himself in 151-proof rum and lit his body on fire. Though he never admitted to the incident, he later joked about it during his comedy show Richard Pryor, Live on Sunset Strip. The Los Angeles Police Department testified that, while burning, Pryor ran from his home down Parthenia Street until police subdued him. Once he arrived at the hospital, he was treated for second and third degree burns. 
He spent six weeks in recovery at Sherman Oaks Hospital. Later, one of his daughters, Rain, would state that the incident occurred due to a bout of drug-induced psychosis. In 1983, Pryor signed a five-year deal with Columbia Pictures. He was given $40 million to start his own production company, Indigo Productions. Under this company, he released Superman III, 1983, Brewster's Millions, 1985, Moving, 1988, and See No Evil, Hear No Evil, 1989. Each film showcased a departure from Pryor's signature raunchy style, instead appealing to demographics previously alienated from the comedian. The only movie released during this time that reflected Pryor's authenticity was Joe Joe Dancer Your Life Is Calling, a semi-autobiographical account of his life. Despite the profanity that arguably defined Pryor's comedic career, he was offered to host a children's show on CBS called Pryor's Place in 1984. The show acted as an alternative to Sesame Street, with Pryor hanging out with puppets in an urban setting. Unfortunately, the show was canceled after a brief run on the air. The comedian hosted the Academy Awards twice. In 1977, he co-hosted alongside Warren Beatty, Ellen Burstyn, and Jane Fonda. In 1983, he co-hosted with Liza Minnelli, Walter Matthau, and Dudley Moore. Before the awards show, Pryor was warned not to use profanity in his set. After an early slip-up, the network instituted a five-second delay when returning from a commercial break. Additionally, Pryor was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for his work on Chicago Hope. He had developed a negative reputation for his demanding, disrespectful behavior on set. Gene Wilder, one of Pryor's co-stars, wrote in his autobiography that Pryor frequently arrived late and made selfish demands. Wilder even cited an instance wherein Pryor insisted on traveling via helicopter due to his being the film's star. After an incident involving an ill-fated production intern and a slice of watermelon, Pryor arranged for the intern to be fired, with Wilder suggesting drug abuse as the reason. Later years, health issues, and unveiled secrets. In 1986, Richard Pryor was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or MS. The diagnosis came just nine years after the comedian suffered a severe heart attack at the age of 36. From 1986 through the early 90s, Pryor used a power-operated mobility scooter to accommodate his illness. Without missing a beat, America's most infamous comedian stated that MS stood for more shit. Pryor's last appearance on the film's big screen would be in Lost Highway 1997, a David Lynch classic. In it, he played the small role of Arnie, an auto repair garage manager appearing on his mobility scooter for the first and final time on camera. Shortly after, Pryor appeared in the cold open segment of an episode of The Norm Show, entitled Norm vs. The Boxer. Pryor portrayed an older man with nurse-directed anger issues, this would be Pryor's last television appearance. In 2002, Pryor and his wife Jennifer Lee finally acquired the rights to all of Laugh's material, including Pryor's comedic recordings from the 1960s and 1970s. The material amounted to roughly 40 hours of analog tape, and Jennifer granted it to Rhino Records in 2004 with the intention of repurposing it and publishing it as a compilation album. On February 1, 2005, a double CD was released, Evolution Revolution, The Early Years. Nine days after Pryor's 65th birthday, the actor suffered a heart attack at his Los Angeles home. After Jennifer Lee tried and failed to resuscitate him, he was taken to a Westside hospital. On the morning of December 10, 2005, Richard Pryor was pronounced dead at 7.58 a.m. Jennifer hauntingly stated, at the end there was a smile on his face. Pryor was cremated, and family members in Hana, Hawaii, scattered his remains. A forensic pathologist found that Pryor's death was due to coronary artery disease brought about by smoking tobacco. However, many have theorized the comedian's history of substance abuse to have played a part in his passage. After his death, shocking revelations emerged. In 2014, nine years after the fatal heart attack, Author Scott Paul stated in his biographical book, Becoming Richard Pryor, that the comedian frequently acknowledged his bisexuality. This statement was later confirmed in 2018 by Quincy Jones and Jennifer Lee. 
who revealed that Pryor had had sexual relations with Marlon Brando. Pryor was reportedly open with friends and family about his sexual orientation and that he slept with men. Rain, one of Pryor's daughters, has disputed this claim, but Jennifer Lee swears by the truth. She later alluded to TMZ that in combination with the drugs and the carefree attitude of the 1970s, Pryor likely did sexually engage with men. Pryor's comedy was known for its raw honesty, irreverence, and fearless exploration of taboo subjects, including race, politics, and social issues. He drew inspiration from his life experiences, often using humor to cope with adversity and shed light on the human condition. He pioneered the passageway for black entertainers at an unjust period of American history. Many often remember his closing statement from the episode of Saturday Night Live hosted by Richard Pryor. At the end, he said, I'd like to say something with hope, love, and peace. The first time I was on live television, I'd never done anything like this before. I want to thank everybody, and I want you all to know that from now on, I will never be the same again.